Apocalypsis Jesu Christo. That's Greek. And it's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Apocalypsis, we get our apocalypse. Apocalypse means revelation. But we have now taken the word apocalypse and we've associated it with chaos. Catas catastrophic events. We, we make that, we associate that with apocalypse. Yeah. Apocalypse. apocalypse. But in the actuality, it means revelation, the unveiling. Okay, thanks. In the book, in this book, the Holy Spirit pulled back, pulls back the curtain and gives us the privilege of seeing the glorified Christ in heaven in fulfillment of his sovereign purposes in this world. From the day that God created the earth, he knew what the end was going to be. He knew what it was. Every day, every second, he knows exactly what's happening. It's all planned out. And the Holy Spirit is going to pull back this curtain and he's going to open it up for all of us. And what, what to expect. This book is going to teach us to be strong. It's going to teach us to be prepared for what's going to happen. It teaches us not to be consumed with what is going on around us. Where we are going, where we are going right now in the future <clears throat> is so much deeper than anything that's going on in the world today. It's deeper. It, you know, political, uh, uh, political parties, the economy, all of that stuff is nothing. It means absolutely nothing when we, when we look at, compare it to the book of Revelation, and what is really going to happen in the future. Because what's, what's happening today is child's play compared to what's going to happen. Be strong, church. Be prepared. Be willing to suffer, realizing that no matter how powerful evil may seem, Jesus Amen. is the victor. Amen. Thank you, Lord. John 16, 33. I have told you all this so that you may have peace. <coughs> what? Peace. peace. In me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart. Because I have overcome the world. Amen. Amen. All right? And right now I'm going to tell you a little secret. I've read the last chapter. <laughs> we win. <laughs> you know, the book, and the book may be hard to understand because it encompasses all the books of the Bible. Revelation is like, like taking a novel and reading and picking it up. They go a novel, you know, about yay big, you know, and you turn it to the last chapter and you read the last chapter. Now, many of us might have done that in our book reports when we were in students still in school. But if all you do, if you have a book like that, and all you do is read the last chapter. You miss a whole lot because you don't know. You have no idea what gets us to that last chapter and the development of the people and everything like that. Same thing with Revelation. To understand Revelation, we have to understand the other 65 books. And we're going to spend a lot of time in the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel. If you, if you want to understand the book of Daniel, you have to read Revelation. If you want to understand Revelation, you have to read the book of Daniel. But there are so many other books that, that pertain to the end times.
Before we get into the book of Revelation, we need to recognize the golden rule of Bible interpretation. Now, some of you here have just finished up the book of hermeneutics from Global University, and it's, it's the, the essence of, of understanding the Bible. Number one, recognize that symbols are always interpreted by Scripture itself. If you go back, if you go back in the New Testament, when Jesus spoke of parables, after he was done speaking to the people, the disciples would come up to him and say, hey, what does it mean? And he would explain. The Bible will explain what the parable meant. Symbols. The Bible will tell us what the symbols mean. Two, we look for the symbols meaning in the immediate passage. How many know? Don't ever, you know, when you read the Bible or it's a one, one verse really sticks out, always read the verse before and read the verse after. Yeah, right. Well, we look for the symbols meaning in the immediate passage. If we don't find the answer in the passage, we go further through the book. Anywhere else in the book does it say what the symbol means? If we don't find an interpretation in the same book, we go into the rest of the Bible. <clears throat> you know, God didn't write the Bible to confuse us. There's a reason why he wrote the Bible, and he wants us to understand it. But above all, above all, when you get into the Bible, it doesn't matter which which book we read, ask the Holy Spirit to just guide you. That's what the Holy Spirit, and that's His job, to guide us. Don't go back. Pardon? Don't go back. He's the author. I'm sorry? He says, He's the author. Amen. sense. Seek no other sense, which will be nonsense. Okay. Revelation, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. I, I love how the book of Revelation was passed on. Whoops, excuse me. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave to him. God gave the book of Revelation to Jesus Christ. Remember when Jesus was walking on earth and and well, when will all this take place? Well, only the Father knows. The Father is now giving Jesus 
what's going to happen. Jesus turns it around and he sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant John who faithfully reported everything he saw. So it goes from the Father to Jesus to an angel to John and from John to us. Privilege. I'm sorry? That's a lot of privilege for us. Yes. We know. Yeah. So, this whole thing, as Albert here just said, the whole thing, we got the whole thing from the author of the book. Yes. It's come to us. Now, John, John says everything that he saw, he wrote. Now, sometimes, sometimes this will get kind of switched around because many times in the book of Revelation, Jesus himself will tell John what's going to happen. Jesus will convey the future to John personally. The events of these books are things that must soon take place. Now, in Greek, the word soon can mean quickly, swiftly, speedily, at a rapid rate. The term must soon take place means that when these events start to occur in the end times, they will then progress rapidly. Now, I got it. You know, to me personally, whoops. To me personally, you know, in the last 10 years, I have never seen us go downhill so fast. In the world. So, so these events start to occur in the end time. They will then progress rapidly, which it is doing right now. Now, like I said, John is John himself swore that that what he saw. He wrote down everything that was given to him in a divine uh, revelation. He wrote down and he's presenting it to us. Everything is from the Father, from Jesus Christ. Now, uh, the word blessed in verse 3, uh, in verse 3 means spiritually happy. Now, Revelation is the only book in the Bible that promises um, a blessing to the person who reads it out loud and the person who listens to it. It's the only book in the Bible. Now, I can tell you right now, there are a lot of books in the Bible that are a lot more good feeling than Revelation. That can make me a whole lot happier than what the book of Revelation. But again, we are blessed to have this word because we are to take the word and go out. God does not want us to be so happy and settled that, well, hey, I'm sitting here now and I'm waiting for him to come back. You know, I'm going to heaven. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? We're going to heaven. But what about our neighbors? What about the ones across the street? I've got relatives that don't know the Lord. And believe me, I don't want them going through this. I don't. <clears throat> it, it sends shivers up and down my spine just thinking about them having to go through this. Yeah. It's that bad. Now also in verse 3 it says, For the time is near. And it should not be taken to me that the events of Revelation will necessarily happen soon. There's a progression. Matthew. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as we were, for as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming 
of the Son of Man. Like a thief in the night. A thief in the night. Are we ready? Are we ready? Greetings to the seven churches. And from Jesus Christ, the, you know what? I'm not going to make it for an hour and a half. <laughs> Would somebody like to read this? Please. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, made us and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Amen. Thank you. At the time of John's writing, which was probably around 96, 95 AD, these seven churches that we're going to be talking about first were going through various trials, different trials, each church. The Roman emperor, by the name of Titus Flavius Domitian, had demanded that he be worshipped as Lord and God. And the refusal of the Christians to obey this edict led to severe punishment. So one of the reasons this, this book was written was to encourage and motivate these suffering believers and to give them strength and hope. Now it says in there from the seven, the seven spirits, Is it? No, no, church. No? Okay. Give me this one. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. I, uh, in the book, in the book, of, in the Bible, when I say the book, I'm referring to the Bible, okay? You're going to see, many times, you're going to see the number seven. Okay? Seven, it means completion. One hundred percent. Complete, 100%. That's what the, the number seven means. <coughs> okay, so it says in uh, the Bible, the number, well, I just said that, okay. Uh, in Isaiah 11, 12, it speaks of the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit. Sevenfold. Again, the number seven. Complete. The Holy Spirit is complete. In, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, uh, verse 2, it, it talks about the seven different, again, number seven, the def, seven different, uh, basically, jobs, you might say, of the Holy Spirit. And uh, so, some believe that the seven spirits are the seven angels that are before the throne. Angels. I've got to find a spot here. Angels in the Bible. Our messengers. Angels are messengers in the Bible. Um, so, the all glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood. 
you know, when, when you read this, don't, inside personally, don't, don't get all worried and frustrated and anxious. For the unbelievers, absolutely, but not for ourselves. We're not going to be around. We're not going to be around for the majority of this stuff. Okay, later on, we're going we're gonna to talk about how we're going to get out of here. My my wife, my Mary, she always says, you know, I don't care. I don't care when it happens. All I know is I'm going to be on that first bus out of here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, you're not, she's not going to be on the bus. When that happens, She'll learn that day she's gonna learn how to fly. Because <laughs> we're gonna fly out of here. Uh, Revelation. Uh, one the next one. Oh. You know, I somehow I missed. There it is. We just did this one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Free from our sins. Jesus, Jesus saves his people from sin. Now Jesus means, the word Jesus means Yahweh saves. Okay. Or uh, Yahweh is salvation. That's it. That's, that's our Jesus. The ruler of the kings of the on earth. Christ is absolutely sovereign. Mm -hmm. For by him, we read this one already, but for by him all things are created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. For who? For him. Jesus. Everything. He created everything we see outside. Look at your neighbor. Look at the person in front of you. Look at the person behind you. Except for the people in the last row. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you You know, God created them. You know, don't ever, don't ever be angry with the person next to you. Right. You're going to reign for forever with that person. Yes. So you might as well summon whatever the difference is right now. Yes. Amen. He made us, he made us a kingdom of priests. Jesus made us a kingdom of priests. He freed us from sin by his blood. And he released us to serve. We are priests. <coughs> Got to get that in here. We are what? Priests. priests. What? Priests. Yes, we are priests. Because we are priests, we have a job to do. And it's not to sit on our duff. Which a lot of us like to do. Especially when we get retired. <laughs> so what is a priest? What is the role of a priest? First of all, a priest brings people to Jesus. <coughs> a priest represents man before God. As Moses did in the desert. A priest always cares for the people. A priest always cares for the people. We are priests because God has freed us. Those are that's our job, people. That is our job. 
to represent man before God, to care for people. Verse 7 says that, Behold, he is coming in the clouds. Just as Jesus was received by a cloud at his ascension, that's the way he's coming back in the clouds. Somebody like to read that? <clears throat> I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering in God's kingdom and in the patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. It was the Lord's day and I was worshiping in the spirit. Suddenly, I heard behind me a loud voice like it was a trumpet blast. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, John is on the Isle of Patmos. It was on the Sabbath day. And the Isle of Patmos, um, it, it wasn't exactly a resort. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not a place where, where somebody would want to reserve a place. John and his readers were persecuted by the Roman government. Persecution was very common to the people in, in, in the theme of Revelation. John identifies those who are going through trials and tribulation for the cause of Jesus. So he's on the island of Patmos. Here we have Patmos right here. And if, if, yeah, Ephesus, you can see where the, the line ends up there. Ephesus. Ephesus is where actually John was from. When they had the great dispersion in Jerusalem, John wound up there in Ephesus. And that's where he lived. And that's where he was arrested. And then he was sent down over here to Patmos. So Patmos is a small rocky island in the Aegean Sea off Asia Minor, which is today Turkey. And uh, the Romans probably used Patmos as a penal colony. That's where they sent people. John was forced daily. John was forced daily to work in the mines on the island. And John was banished to Patmos because of his witnessing for Jesus Christ. So John was in prayer when behind him he hears a loud voice like a trumpet. And it says, write in the book everything you see and send it to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Write, write what you see and send it to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And I'm turning. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of, a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Wow. He said, one, like the Son of Man. Why would he say that? Sure. 
Because what he saw was a human form, but not quite human. The appearance of Jesus. White hair. White hair means purity. Long robe with a sash, a priest. Well, same thing here. Eyes of fire. Piercing discernment. Face shiny like the sun. Remember the transfiguration? And the bronze feet? years that changed he became a human being but outside of those 33 years for infinity he has always looked like oh, that wow. and I got news for you someday we're all going to look like that <laughs> someday we're all going to be just like that no beer. No beer. No beer. No beer. No beer. No beer. Well, no beer. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you would bring out beer. I'd love to have a white beer. I have a question. Yeah. What were the seven stars? Pardon? What were the seven stars? We'll get to that. Okay. That is so cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. His eyes were like, well, we got did all that. Yeah. Second Corinthians. And we, we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into what? Same image. From one degree of glory to another for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We will all someday. Wow, that's exciting. I always got to make sure on the right page here. Okay. Um, second Revelation 117. Well, I think we did that. No, no, no. 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 have not. Okay. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. Has always been there and always will be. That's our Lord. Yeah. 
So that's John when he looks back and, and, and sees oh, yeah. the sea. Whoa! What is this? Whoa. Yump and yiminy. Whoa. Woe is me. Yeah, woe is me. He's <laughs> Wow. Wow. So write down what you have seen and the things that you are, that are happening, the things that will happen. Um, outline of Revelation. As we're getting into that. <coughs> Things that you saw, chapter, chapter one, those are things that, that John has seen, okay? Chapters two through three, things that are. In other words, the things that are would be like the, the seven churches that were at that time, in, in, and he was writing to the letters to these seven churches. So things that are. Chapters four through 22, are going to be things that are beyond John, that are beyond that time, the future. Chapters 4 through 22. You know what we're going to do? We're going to take a five minute break. Oh, okay. So I just kind of get up, move around a little bit. <laughs> Chapter 1, verse 20. This is the mystery of the seven stars, which right here. Whoops. Not working. Seven. They're gone. Sorry. Sorry. So much for that one. Okay, the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Generally, as for the mystery, that generally refers to the truth, to a truth that was unknown to the people living in the Old Testament times but are explained in the New Testament times. Colossians 126, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. That's us. Okay, the seven stars. They are the angels of the seven churches. Now, again, Another word for angels is messengers. These messengers are uh, more likely the pastors of the seven churches because they deliver the message of God to the congregation. So the seven stars that, that you saw in that, that portrait there were probably the seven pastors of the seven churches. He holds, Jesus holds in his hands, in his right hand. Now the right hand is, is the hand of power. Okay, and some may be left hand, but in this case, the right hand is the hand of power. And Jesus holds the pastors in his right hand. Oh. Pastor Nathan. He holds Pastor Nathan in his right hand. Amen. It, uh, it symbolizes his sovereign control over each church and its leaders. The seven golden lampstands, as you saw, I'm going to go back to that, okay? Jesus, the Son of Man, is in the midst of the seven churches. That means that Jesus is intimately aware of what is going on in each of his churches. Wow. Mm -hmm. Intimately aware of what is going on. Mm -hmm. This morning in our service, he was here 
Yes. He was watching, Back to the listening, <coughs> yep. and probably with a smile on his face. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. In Revelation 2, 1, it tells us that Jesus walks among his churches. He observes them and knows what is right and wrong in each one. Okay, three things to remember as we read about these churches. Number one, we must read these letters literally. <coughs> All right, read the letters literally. These letters are universal and timeless. Just as that Bible, written thousands of years ago, is timeless. It's the Word of God. It will be until He calls us all home. The letters are prophetic. And we'll get into that. But the letters are prophetic. Okay. As, um, as we get into this now, and we read about the seven churches... <laughs> Along with the seven churches, there are also seven church ages. Now, one thing about John, John knew what was going on because he was there. He knew what the seven churches were going through. What he did not know was that these seven churches are also prophetic. Various, um, various views have been held by Bible students regarding the meaning of these seven churches in Revelation. First of all, the seven churches represent several literal churches which were in existence at the time of John. And the description played out in chapters 2 and 3 were their exact conditions. These seven churches present a picture of seven different kinds of churches in the world during the entire church age. Now one thing that John couldn't do that we can, we can look back. He couldn't look forward. There are churches today which are warm and on fire like the church of Ephesus. There are others which are cold and dead, like Laodicea. There are churches like the Thyatira, which are full of ritualism and ceremonialism. Mm -hmm. There are those like the Church of Sardis, which are mere dead formalism. Mm -hmm. Like I said, today we can look back and see these seven churches are, are a progressive picture of the history of God's church from the first coming of Christ to a second coming. Each describes in unmistakable detail and clearness a certain period of church history. The church at Ephesus. So you see in red here, the seven churches. You know what? What's really, you know, um, as, as we go through these churches, and, and remember now, these are church ages that from the beginning to the end, all right, there are seven church ages. Observe, first one is Ephesus. They go in clockwise rotation. I thought that was really neat. Yeah. Wow. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven gold, golden lampstands. Oops. No. Golden 
commenced it. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not, if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Ephesus. Ephesus means the desirable one. It, re it represents the church. It represents the church from... Excuse me. From A.D. 30 to 100. I'm sorry, it was over there. It includes the church in the book of Acts, often referred to as the Apostolic Church. It was the early church with all the zeal of its first love burning for Christ. Church was known for perseverance. <clears throat> Doing something despite difficulty. Now I remind you, I remind you, all of these churches were going through a hard time. They were, every one of them was being persecuted. The Romans had absolutely no tolerance for these churches. And if you go back in history, they did horrible things to the Christians. But Christ is telling them, go back. Go back to your first love. Yes. Even today, you can see in the churches where there used to be, do you remember when you first got saved? Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. You were ready to turn the world on fire. Yeah. But over the years, we kind of came down. And I don't know about you, but I remember I up here, and then all of a sudden down in the valley, and then back up again, and like a roller coaster. God wants us. That's where God wants us. Okay, the church was known for its perseverance, doing something despite difficulty. Paul spent three years building up the church. Thirty years earlier, the Ephesian church had been commended by Paul for its love and had shown others. Wait, excuse me, let me read it. Thirty years earlier, the Ephesian church had been comm commended by Paul for the love it had shown others and the Lord. Timothy pastored there for a year. And I, as I said in the beginning, John lived there. Okay. Let's see what's next. Surprise me. Oh. I guess we're not there. Okay. okay. Here we have. Here we have the, the seven church ages, the seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. <coughs> Ephesus, the apostolic church, the church of Acts. Mm. Smyrna, Roman persecution. We're going to get into each one of these. Pergamum, <coughs> age of Constantine. Wow. Extremely interesting. Wow. Thyatira. 
the Dark Ages. These are from AD 30 to 100, 100 to 300, 313, 313 to 600, 600 to 1517, the Dark Ages. 1517 to 1648, Sardis, Reformation, time of Martin Luther. <coughs> Philadelphia, the Missionary Church, that's from 1649 to 1900. That's when, when all of a sudden, you know, they were sending out missions of missionaries all over the world. Philadelphia, Laodicea, apostasy, from 1900 to present. Can you hold that long enough? I can take one picture. Go ahead. Thank you. Everybody else it has is. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is. Let me see. Let me see. Yes, ma'am. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You should get it any second. Yeah, it's the way the light is shining. Maybe you should print off all of your PowerPoints. Sorry about the layer. It's just the way the light is No matter where I put that hat. All right. All right, Revelation 2, 1 through 7. <coughs> I have no idea where that is. It's in the book. I read that. Okay, read that. Okay, Ephesians 1, 15 through 16. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith, in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks to you or for you, remembering you in my prayers. So about 60 years after Pentecost, after Pentecost, their church started to cool off and became indifferent. The church at Ephesus. 60 years after Pentecost. What is Pentecost? Anybody? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Ephesus started falling away in 90 AD. They lost their first love. God tells the church that they were never to forget where they, where they had fallen, from where they had fallen. If they did not change, God warns that he will remove their lampstand. We're going to talk about the Nicolaitans later. The faithfulness of God still saves and rewards the individual believer in every age. God ends with a promise. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life. From the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. That's Ephesus. Then we go to the church of Smyrna. Church of Smyrna, 
way. These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue <coughs> of Satan. Keep on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> threw you a curveball there. <laughs> Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer, I tell you. The devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Smyrna, that church age lasted from A.D. 100 to 313. Often referred to as the Church of Roman Persecution. Smyrna means myrrh. One of the smyrrh or uh, fragrant spice. One of the spices used in the ritual, ritual of Israel. Myrrh is a fragrant spice but it has to be crushed and beaten small in order for it to give forth its full fragrance and perfume. It was a perfect representation of the church in that day. The Christians suffered terribly in those days, but the more they suffered, the more fragrant was their testimony. I read, or I heard, I should say, that as, as Christians were being tied up and, and basically put up on poles and set on fire. They were singing. They were singing to God as they were burning. Their testimony was a fragrant aroma to God. Second Timothy 3.12 in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, it says, suffer for 10 days. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I, will te I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Why 10 days? See, have any of you ever asked that question? Why 10 days? Well, what I've come up with, okay? Because that was how long it took for the Roman justice system to bring in the guilty verdict and carry out the death sentence. It took 10 days. What, was you, what did you come up with on that? I wasn't sure about it, no. Oh. I, it's always been a question for me. But that's what it took, it took 10 days for a person to be be sent to guilty plea, a guilty verdict, ten days later, they're, they're executed. God tells us not to be fearful. God knows the suffering that we will experience, but tells us not to fear. When we get tested, it would show where our loyalty was or where our loyalty lies. Romans. Somebody want to read that? <clears throat> if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. So whatever we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Amen. Amen. Thank you. The Roman Empire sought to eradicate the faith of Jesus in the face of the earth. They severely punished or persecuted Christians in the city who refuse to say Caesar is Lord. The words that stand out in these verses are tribulation, poverty, suffer, prison. Christians were burned, beaten, hanged, 
crucified, fed to the lions, and tortured. This church, this church right here at Smyrna, they were persecuted under ten emperors. Ten of them. I'll read them off if you want, otherwise we'll just go leave it there. But the more the Christians suffered, the more fragrant was their testimony. In the arena, they met the lions quoting scripture and singing songs. Tens of thousands of Christians were put to death for their faith. The Christians were rich anyway. These believers actually had a large storehouse of eternal riches awaiting them in heaven. Um, did you read about um, one of the emperors actually going after the descendants of the family of Jesus? The no, descendants? No, going what? The descendants? Yeah. The, no, the children, the grandchildren. What? I read that somewhere that yeah. one of the emperors actually went after anybody that was considered part of that family of Mary and Joseph. He went after all of them. I did. I yeah. The crown of life is given to those who persevere under trial and especially to those who suffer to the point of death. The first death, first death that we will experience is physical death. The second death is for unbelievers. <clears throat> who will suffer eternal separation from God and <clears throat> eternal hell. That's Smyrna. She suffered terribly. Pergamum, powerful fortress, marriage. Disgusting. Uh, can I read something related to that, Smyrna, what you just said? Oh, she short. suffered terribly. <laughs> If it's short. <laughs> oh, okay. No, it's just that going from there to there, and the, the numbers you're putting up there, 80, 30 to uh, 100, and the mother was 113. Yeah. These are generations after the original um, believers that had that, had that had to be given to the next generation, the faith. And they stayed with it and suffered. And it's today's martyrs, too. Yeah, she hit right on what I said earlier. The, these churches were suffering at that time, but these churches were were uh, the seven church ages, yeah. if you remember. Yeah. Okay, this church age, as as Diana just said, um, from one hundred to three thirteen. All right, that was those years. That was two hundred and thirteen years that they suffered under these yeah. ten emperors. For 200, for 213 years, they were persecuted, they were tortured. Uh -oh. All these horrible things were done to these people, but they continued, they continued to serve. They continued. Mm -hmm. For 213 years, when they were put in the arena and the lions came after them, they were singing, recording scripture as they were being torn apart. Oh, 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 church. Big part. Wow, what a powerful church. To be able to send it down to the next generation to yeah. me is just amazing. Right. Yes. And it's stuck. Yes. Very much so. Thank you. To the angel of the church, no. As we go on, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. <coughs> going to start coming down. All right? Every church, from here on in, every church starts getting worse. Starting to go away from God. To the angel of the church of Pokemon, write, These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, 
who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. How'd you like that? For your city where Satan lives. <laughs> oh, thank you. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you have all you have those who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manner. I will give to them that a person, or that a person, a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Wow. I'm, I'm sure I'm not there right now. Wow. There we go. Huh. <coughs> Now we're back up to talk. <laughs> okay, Pergamum. Pergamum. From 3... I'm sorry. Okay, 313 to 600. What was the revelation? 313 to 600. Pergamum. Powerful fortress. This is what Pergamon means. Powerful fortress, marriage. Kind of odd, isn't it? <laughs> marriage. This church was married to the government. <laughs> Citizens of Pergamon were expected to participate in, in the civil and pagan religions of emperor worship. Oh, okay. Okay, so they were married to the government. They were hand in hand. A failure to comply was interpreted as disloyalty to the state. Now, two doctrines are mentioned here. First of all, first was Balaam. All right, refers to a lackness and, and losing our separate separated position. Numbers twenty five. We got good. Hey. <laughs> Numbers 25, 1 through 3. While Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women, who invited them to the sacrifice of their gods. The people ate the sacrificial meal and bowed down before these gods. So Israel's so Israel yoked themselves to the veil of Peor, and the Lord's anger burned against them. When Balaam could not successfully curse the people of God, he used other methods to destroy them. He seduced them into unbridled, sensual living by dangling the prostitutes of Moab before the men of Israel. During the Pergamum age, Worldly practices and alliances crept in and corrupted the church. Nicolaitans. It seems that the doctrine of the Nicolaitans was, was that it was all right to have one foot in both worlds. So the Nicolaitans said, hey, it's all right. There's no problem. You can have one foot in the world and one foot in religion. Nothing like straddling the fence post. One world, one foot is in yes, the other one is in no. Can you imagine where you, what happens when you meet the judgment seat with straddling that fence post? Thank you. A no is a no. So they believed that was all right to to have one foot in each world. That one, that one needn't be so strict about separation from the world in order to be a Christian. This led to a weak version of Christianity that was without power and without conviction. This led, um, they also promoted the rise of the hierarchy of the clergy. So what they're saying, basically, is that uh, 
the hierarchy. In other words, the the priest, the head of the the, the rich, you know, the, the people with influence, the elite. They're up here. Right. Everybody else is down here. Right. And they promoted that. Pretty much like now. I'm sorry? I said pretty much like they're trying to do now. Yeah, very true. Yeah. Basically, the rulers over the peons. Later on, the clergy were the only ones, clergy were the only ones that were to read the Bible and to interpret it. Not the peons. And for the clergy to stay up there, they had to be married to the government. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the government kick them out. Mm -hmm. So they had they they conformed. They married to the, to the government, and they started playing games. And that's that's where we have the the marriage. It wasn't until 1436 when in Germany, who guy by the name of Gutenberg invented the press. In 1517, Martin Luther read the Bible and said, hang on a minute. <laughs> this isn't right. So Martin Luther challenged the church. And that was the reason Jesus hated the doctrine and the deeds of the Nicolaitans. What, what we have here in this color and then over here in this color that's the old Roman Empire <coughs> the Roman Empire got to be too big couldn't handle it you had Rome Rome over here and it, look how vast that area was. And they just couldn't control it. So in the year 1313, Rome decided, hey, we're going to split this baby in half. All right? And that half went right through here. So the Western Rome was Rome. Did I say Western Rome? <laughs> the Western Empire was Rome. The Eastern Empire was Constantinople. There was a guy. What? Oh, there was a gentleman by the name of Constantine. And he was called Constantine the Great. And he became the emperor of the eastern part of the empire. This guy, Constantine, he, was, he, got, he got himself into a few battles. And things just were not going his way. You know, the last thing you want, you know, an emperor, an emperor didn't last real long. You know, <laughs> somebody, somebody was always there to get rid of him. Whether it was a brother, a sister, an uncle, whoever. You know, you always had to look behind to see who was coming with a dagger or a sword. So, having, de having suffered a number of defeats without any victories, started concerning him, this Constantine. So in 1313, he was going up into another battle. And, uh, then, before the battle, he proclaimed that in a dream, he saw a huge cross. A huge cross. And what it said, the words over the cross were, in this sign, thou shalt conquer. Cross above the cross were the words, within this sign, you shall conquer. Well, 
with all these defeats behind him, he didn't take a nuclear physicist to figure out, maybe I better listen to this. So Constantine took this to mean that if he embraced the cross, he would be victorious. Well, in an act of desperation, he professed to become a Christian and decreed that henceforth the religion of the Roman Empire was to be Christianity. Is it old oh, 630? Sorry, folks. <laughs> <laughs> you want to hear the end of the story? Go back next week. Good job. Good job. So give us a hint of what happened. It's a We want to see the trailer. Let's let's close it first. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all the treasures that are within it, Lord. And we thank you for your mercy. Lord, even as we read about the people who didn't serve you, Lord, who, who left you, Lord, there's always some, and you always, always have mercy on them, some that come back to you. And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for your mercy. And to these people that were in these churches then and the people now, Lord, you continue to be merciful and we praise you for that. Lord, help us to gain an understanding of the book of Revelation. Lord, help us to get serious about reaching those around us for the gospel. Yes. Lord, just uh, open our, our eyes and our, our hearts and our minds, Lord. Help us not to be get cold. But, Lord, help our love for you to stay on fire, Lord. And we just ask for your guidance and your blessing. And we thank you so much for your continued love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you, and hope to see you next week. <laughs>